All right, good morning. Shh. Welcome back. Shh. Um, please sign into the attendance. Uh, most of you have. Um, questions? Anything in your minds? No? Okay. Uh, some good news. The I actually got my copy. Ah, you know, so actually it was on my desk this morning. So if you want, I'll pass this around, take a look. Uh, the books should have it shortly, but this is the hot off the press, first copies. Okay, um, our topic today is a single case, but it's a significant case. Um, it's the Obamacare case, NFIB versus Sibelius. Um, this will probably be a little different uh, than, than most classes because it's a case I have taught more times than I could possibly count. So uh, this one will be a little bit more of a lecture because I want to convey um, a significant amount of information in a fairly short time. So I'll be lecturing more. If you have questions, please raise your hand, but I won't be, I'll be sparing you the indignity of going up and down the aisles, at least, at least, for, at least for today. Tomorrow we'll be back to normal, or Thursday. Um, I started teaching in August of 2012. It was August 13th, it was my birthday. Um, the Obamacare case, NFIB, was decided June 28th, 2012. So I started teaching a few months after this case was decided. And this was a huge um, deal, a huge decision. Um, it's also an important teaching case in that it brings together um, everything we've studied so far. Uh, commerce clause, uh, necessary and proper clause, taxing power, spending power, the role of the courts, politics, the president. It's like everything um, was combined into this perfect storm, hence the stormy skies on the cover, into this perfect storm uh, that gave rise to this case. Uh, this is also the subject of my first book, which I wrote um, in 2012 and 2011 mostly. Um, and actually, Professor Barnett wrote the forward to my book before he was my co-author, so things sort of progress uh, along the way. Now we're s equal billing on the, on the cover. Um, but this case was very significant, and I want to try to walk you through this. Um, now, 2012 was now, my goodness, seven years ago. And most of you, I guess, were probably in high school, give or take, in 2012, middle school, yeah. See, it's, uh, I get older, you say the same age. I was thinking about law school. Like professors get older and all the students keep being, you're the same age. Um, so as time progresses, this has less salience, right? It doesn't have the same weight because you didn't live through it contemporaneously. So my goal here is to try to bring you back to um, this topic. By the way, I, do you want to know what tomorrow is? Just, it's 9-11, right? It's, it's September 11th. Um, you know, it's now, my goodness, what, 18 years since. Now, a lot of you probably don't even remember it or have no recollection of 9-11. Uh, if you do, it's probably very, very faint. I'm actually going to give a lecture tomorrow at a law school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And our topic is First Amendment, which is something I lecture on a lot. And uh, the dean, the dean, actually told the students that we could not talk about terrorism, violence, or guns in 9-11. I have sympathy to people. My goodness, that's, that's, that, that's awful. I've never had any dean put a term on my debate. Uh, fortunately, she withdrew her request because I objected. I would have ignored it anyway. Um, I would have. I, would, I wasn't planning on talking about those topics, but I was damn straight not going to be told not to. Uh, you know, <laughs> the quickest way to make someone do someone, you know, the quickest way to make someone do something is tell them not to do it. Right? If you say, don't do this, you're going to do it. Uh, and and uh, uh, especially if it's the election of the First Amendment. But, you know, Dates like 9-11, the Obamacare case, these are, for me, not historical events, things I lived through, but I have to remember that students didn't, and they are now history, so I have to teach it as such. Um, the Obamacare story, yeah. Some students flip through it. Yeah, some, but, but the number dwindles. Yeah, the, the, the number will dwindle, and I have to be cognizant of that when I teach it. I can't presume that people know things that happened 18 years ago. It's, 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 it's not a fair assumption for me to make. The same way, I don't presume you know what happened during the Civil War or what happened during World War II. I have to start teaching 9-11 the same way, that it's a historical event. It happened, and 
you learn about it in school, not because you live through the day. And I, I think you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's a fact of my job that things get dated, right. jokes get dated, references, movie references, you know, pop culture. It's gotta, gotta keep with the times. All right. So the story of the ACA begins uh, uh, with President Obama, and this was a signature law that he backed shortly after winning office in 2008. Uh, but the Obamacare case represented a clash between the presidency, the Congress, as well as the Supreme Court. <clears throat> and they clashed over something that may seem fairly you know, quaint, but they clashed over the Constitution. And specifically, the Constitution with respect to one of the most um, significant issues we have in our society today and 20 years ago, which is health care, and what role the government can play in trying to make health care more affordable and more comprehensive. Now, this picture, let's see if anyone knows what this picture is of. This is my, uh, this is my litmus test. What's, what am I, what is this a picture of? You know who these people are, but why, why am I showing you this picture? Yeah. That was when President Clinton announced that the uh, first lady would be leading up the task force uh, yeah. to uh, look into a way to create a national health reform. Very good, yeah. Thank, thank you so much for that. Um, in 1993, she's been around forever, right? In 19, <laughs> there's nothing new, right? It's basically Biden and Clinton, just your entire lives, there's nothing, there's nothing new ever. It really is nothing ever new. In 1993, uh, President Clinton asked First Lady Clinton, uh, she was Rodham Clinton, uh, to chair a task force to uh, propose legislation uh, to introduce a national health care system. Um, this picture is a little bit hard to see, but that's a health security. You can kind of see that over there. Her bill was called the HSA, the Health Security Act. And the idea was, Every American would have had some access to health care, either through a mandatory employer coverage or through some sort of government subsidized plan. Um, as you may know, this bill did not succeed. Um, and in large measure, people opposed this because they thought that it would interfere with their own doctor coverage. There were a series of commercials that ran on TV called Harry and Louise, which maybe you remember. I, I vaguely remember them. Um, and you had this sort of ma and pa sitting at the kitchen table looking over, looking over this thick book. There were no PDFs. These, these thick books describing the, um, uh, the health care plan. And you know, they were saying, you know, I like my doctor. I want to keep my doctor. And these ads were so successful that they uh, killed the popularity of the Clinton health care plan. So in the span of less than a year, the entire thing imploded, right? The bill uh, 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 never made it through Congress. And after 93, the issue of health care uh, was not able to get some sort of national consensus in the federal government. States experiment with different types of plans. Congress sort of nibbled around the edges, but there was no what we call comprehensive health care reform package during this time. Um, that would change following the 2008 election. President Obama made his priority, his first major priority in office, to push forward health care reform. Uh, this is a picture of Chief Justice Roberts uh, giving the oath of office to the president the first time. And here's the do-over. Now, you may remember this, in 2009, uh, in January, January 20th of 2009, they botched the oath. Uh, the way it works is the Chief Justice says a few words and the President repeats them, and the Chief Justice says a few words and the President repeats them, right? But the problem is they were both really smart, and they both had to commit to memory, but they broke at different points. So Roberts was going to say seven words, but Obama was waiting for five words, and so he started speaking at a different time than Roberts did. So they started speaking over each other. So just with no doubts of whether he was actually president, they did a do-over. They redid the oath at the White House the next day, 
because people could say he's not really the president and that would go on for a while right but this was like one of the first like he's not the president moments they they redid the oath okay but the the president made one of his first priorities a health care reform and the bill was known as the patient protection and affordable care act um Today, it's just called the Affordable Care Act. No one ever says patient protection. You don't ever hear it. So you hear Affordable Care Act, ACA, or Obamacare. Now, I actually labored of whether to put the word Obamacare on the, t on the cover. I went back and forth. Um, at various junctures, the president liked the, t liked the phrase and he didn't like the phrase, right? When it was um, popular, he loved Obamacare. And when it was unpopular, it was like, we should. important goals uh, but my focus is is narrow which is always uh, on the US Constitution all right going back to 2009 when this law was being debated um, a lot of people didn't like the law and they didn't like it for a lot of reasons they thought it would uh, put too much control on the federal government that it would uh, take over their plans they'd lose their doctors or all sorts of objections um, one of the primary groups that was pushing these movements forwards was the Tea Party, which is a group that you don't uh, hear much about anymore. Maybe so we've never even heard of them. Um, this was a, how do we describe it? Uh, a sort of, I'll say grassroots, but with like this little asterisk on that. But it was, a, it was a grassroots movement that sort of rose up at the end of the Bush administration in opposition to an, ex, in a, an expanding federal government. Um, and that's the simple way of explaining it. Uh, they had a lot of views. Um, but one of their primary rallying points was the ACA. Um, and for sure, they objected to the ACA on policy grounds. They didn't want the federal government having this much authority over health insurance. Um, but one of the curious aspects of the Tea Party was that they also grounded their objection to the ACA in the Constitution. And this was something that Randy uh, got into fairly deeply at the time. I was still clerking when this was going on. And rather than just saying that Obamacare is bad policy, they said it was unconstitutional. And what's the difference between saying that's a bad policy versus saying it's unconstitutional? Well, for one, it brings the courts to the picture, right? Courts can't stop policies because they're bad. They can only stop them if they're not lawful. Uh, but also, when you argue that something is unconstitutional, it sort of takes on a greater gravity, right? We're not just arguing over petty policy differences, right? There's something greater. Um, and at first, the Tea Party was somewhat small, but it grew and grew and grew uh, until they marched on Washington in the thousands. And they had just a very simple constitutional objection to the ACA. Um, it was one that Randy was very instrumental in helping to spread. And it was the notion that Congress can't make me buy insurance. Right? Uh, most con law arguments are fairly obscure. Right? Try explaining the substantial effects test like your neighbor. Right? It's not, it's not easy. Right? Try explaining you know, what the, how the taxing power works to you know, your, your grandfather. Right? It's not going to be easy. Uh, but there's a very simple idea under the argument in this case. Government can't make me buy insurance. Well, that's easy. Right? I can get that. Right? You can't make me buy something. And this movement rallied around that cause uh, very quickly. Um, indeed, on March 23rd, 2010, I might be off on the date by a couple of days, I think it was March 23rd, uh, there was a huge Tea Party rally in DC. Um, I, was, I wasn't at the rally, well, I went to the rally, but I wasn't there for that reason. I had a conference in DC, but I was walking around, and there were thousands of people, and they were objecting to the ACA, which was going through Congress. And I'll never forget, there was actually a guy who had a sign. You know, he's a random guy, but his sign said, overturn Wickard v. Filburn. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's cool, <laughs> right? Like, when I was before law school, I didn't know what Wickard v. Filburn was. I think none of you did either, but like, they actually had enough sense. They overturned Wickard. 
fair, okay? Um, but the political forces were not enough to stop the ACA. Um, following the 2008 election, uh, there was a Democratic sweep. The Democrats had a huge majority in the House of Representatives, and the Democrats also had a 60-vote block in the Senate. Uh, what's the significance of a 60-vote block? They can defeat the filibuster. Um, in other words, Republicans in the minority were not able to stop the ACA. And they soon realized that the Republicans would not back the health care law. So this was uh, Majority Leader Harry Reid said, OK, we can simply pass the ACA on a straight party line vote. That is, all Republicans saying no and all Democrats saying yes, 60 to 40. Um, this is actually what the bill looked like. It was about 3,000 pages. Um, it was developed over the course of 2009, throughout the entire year. And the actual, version, uh, the actual version that was voted on was finally released in December of 2009, so at the end of the year. Um, did anyone actually read it? Of course not, right? Uh, members of Congress don't, don't have to actually read bills. They just vote on them. Um, in fact, one of the chairmen of the committee actually said, I pay people to read bills for me. Uh, which is which is candid and accurate, uh, way too accurate. Uh, on December thirtieth, I'm sorry, December twenty fourth, Christmas Eve, um, the Senate holds a vote. Right, uh, the version of the bill they were voting on was not the final version. Uh, this was just a version to get things going. The idea was the Senate would pass a basically a draft version of the bill. That bill would be sent to the se uh, House, and the House would make modifications do all the heavy lifting, and send the bill back to the Senate, right? That's how legislation often works. So on Christmas Eve, December 24, 2009, the House passes, I'm sorry, the Senate passes a version of the ACA with 60 votes. But then something happened that was unexpected. Um, Senator Ted Kennedy uh, had long time been the senator from Massachusetts. He had died over the previous summer. In January of 2010, a special election was held to fill the Kennedy vacancy. Um, to the shock of everyone, a Republican won that seat. His name was Scott Brown. He's actually now our ambassador to New Zealand. These people just keep, they, they, they never actually leave. They just sort of change offices, right? Scott Brown won the position. And he ran on the promise of being the 50, I'm sorry, the 41st Republican to block Obamacare. That was his campaign promise. And again, a Republican won office in Massachusetts, so it was very surprising that it, that even happened. But after Scott Brown won, the Democrats had a problem. The GOP now had 41 votes, and they could filibuster the ACA. So what would they do? Well, they had that vote from Christmas Eve, and that was going to be the last time the Senate voted in full on the ACA. That draft bill, which was never meant to be final, would become final, right? So the ACA we have now is basically a draft. It was never designed to be the final bill. It's only the law we have now because of Scott Brown's election. And a lot of the stuff we have is pretty glitchy. It doesn't work right because it was meant to be ironed out down the road. But they couldn't afford to make any significant changes because then they'd be filibustered. So the House then was put in a dilemma. Speaker Pelosi recognized that her caucus had to vote on a bill that no one actually wanted, right? For example, under the law now, uh, every state has their own exchange, right? There's a, there's a New York exchange and a California exchange, et cetera, right? Some of the same exchanges aren't very good. Under the original plan, you'd have a single federal exchange, eliminate all the problems, but now we're stuck with a 50 state different solution. That's just one example, I'll give you dozens. But Pelosi was able to hold her caucus together. And the Republicans, led by John Boehner, uh, did not have the votes to stop them. All he could do is complain. And in uh, March 23rd, 2010, the ACA passes the House of Representatives. On a par near party line vote, um, there were 219 Democrats who voted yay, that's yes, and 34 Democrats voted nay, which is no. Um, all the Republicans voted no, and if I do it quickly enough, I can make a zero. 
Um, there, there it is. Practice, right? Uh, not a single Republican voted for the law. Now, you can read this, I think, a couple different ways. One is that the Republicans were being intransigent. They were being obstructionist, use that, whatever word you want to use. Um, but the other way to look at it is when you pass a massive piece of legislation that transforms a huge chunk of the economy on a party line vote with no buy-in, um, it doesn't have the sort of staying power, right? The sort of consensus that's needed to make it work. And from the moment this bill was passed, there was opposition to it. And to this day, there's still opposition to it. Such that healthcare, which is an important issue, I think all agree, uh, now, now becomes politicized. I think there's, there's a danger. Um, but the bill passed, and it went to the White House, and President Obama signs into law. A uh, fun fact, see he has all these pens over here? Uh, why does he have all these pens? This is like an old Washington thing. When the President signs a bill, he uses different pens to sign it. So pen number one, one stroke. Pen number two, two strokes, right? And they handle the pens out of souvenirs. So I have the pen that signed Obamacare. Well, you have like one of 40 pens. I, th I think if I remember correctly, like there are 20 something pens uh, down there. You can see them all there. And I'll show you the signature in a minute. It's very jagged. Like the O is like dot, 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 dot. You know, it's not, it's not a straight O because uh, he uses so many different pens. Okay. So he signs the bill into law. Yay, you're right. Is that, does that mean it's over? It's done? No, of course. This is America. Everything goes to the courts, right? Totoko told us that 200 years ago. Uh, everything goes to the courts. Within 20 minutes <laughs> of. The president signing the damn pill. Lawsuits were filed across the country. I mean, like minutes later, um, you know, you'll learn about electronic filing soon. You can prepare the stuff in advance and just hit submit when you're ready. So they knew it was coming and had all the papers ready, and they hit just bing submit, and lawsuits began. Okay. Um, one lawsuit was filed in Florida. Another was filed in Virginia, uh, and a couple other filed in D.C., Ohio. I mean, across the country, right? Uh, this was before the era of nationwide injunctions, so you actually have to sue in different places to get different remedies. Now we just, you know, you pick one court in San Francisco and you're done with it. Um, the argument was that Obamacare was unconstitutional. And let me walk you through the argument with a little bit of, of depth, if I can. Um, the ACA had a couple key components. Right. Um, perhaps the most popular aspect of the law is what's called guaranteed issue and community rating. Guaranteed issue and community rating. What is guaranteed issue and community rating? The first part says everyone has to be issued a policy. Right. If you apply for insurance, you're guaranteed to be issued a policy. Guaranteed. What does that mean? They can't deny you coverage. Right. The insurance company has to write you a policy. They can't say, oh, you're too sick. I don't want to insure you. Everyone gets a policy. But the second component is the actual important one. It's called community rating. What does that mean? Your insurance policy is priced based on who you are and where you live. So if I'm a 35-year-old male living in Houston, all 35 males in Houston will have the same rate, right? whether you're sick or healthy. Right? If you're a 24-year-old female living in Houston, all of you have the same insurance rate. You'll be rated based on your community. Right? So the effect of these two policies is that sick people will be guaranteed access to insurance, and they'll be charged the same as their next-door neighbor would if they're the same age. Okay? Now, these are, without question, popular policy. People are, oh my god, how could you deny coverage to sick people? Um, it's also very expensive. right? If you're a young, healthy 35-year-old, you might not use any insurance at all, right? You may be, I mean, I, you know, a lot of you probably, God willing, don't use doctors very often, right? You're healthy. Um, so the insurance companies make a fortune off you. And then there's some people who need it. And they have expensive medicine, expensive surgeries, expensive treatments, expensive specialists. You can go through the list. Um, so there's a, there's a cost shifting problem, right? Um, some people account for a huge share of health care costs, and that's just basic economics. Some states tried to experiment with this approach before, New Jersey and others, and they said, well, um, we're going to make sure that everyone gets a policy and it's priced well. All right, so what did some people start doing? They said, okay, well, I'm healthy now. 
I don't really need insurance, so I'm going to just wait. And if I become sick, um, I'll buy it later. And that way they can't turn me away. Um, in those states where they experimented with this guaranteed issue and community rating, prices went through the roof, right? Because the insurance companies couldn't afford it, right? The insurance companies cannot afford only covering sick people and not having healthy people to spread the cost, right? When you're a healthy person, you buy insurance, you're basically spreading the cost out. Um, so at least one state, Massachusetts, with Governor Mitt Romney, Yes, no one ever changed, which is the same cast of characters keep recycling. This is our world, right? Um, uh, added another element called the individual mandate. And the mandate says, with certain exceptions, you have to maintain insurance. There are exceptions for income, whatever, but for most people, you have to maintain insurance, right? And if you fail to maintain insurance, you pay a penalty. And the idea was, let's... Uh, how shall I say, nudge people, right? Let's shove them into the marketplace, make them buy insurance um, such that uh, there are more healthy people in the system and that spreads the cost. All right, now that was a state. Um, does a state have the power to implement a mandate to purchase insurance? Um, that's a different question from whether Congress does, right? The states have the general police power and Congress does not. Um, I don't think there were any, I should say any, I don't think there were any successful challenges anywhere to state level purchase mandates. So I don't, I don't, can't recall, I think there were not. Okay, so the first question is, does Congress then have the power to impose a mandate? And I'll go into more detail later, but that's the general gist. Um, the second element of the ACA was what's called the Medicaid expansion. Okay, what's Medicaid? Um, there are two federal health care programs. People confuse them. I do sometimes myself. There's Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, Medicare is a health care policy for seniors, right, for senior citizens, right? That's not relevant here, right? When you turn 65, you are eligible for certain types of government health care. And the way I remember it is like Medicare, R is like retired, Sorry, remember if you Medicare is for retired people. That's how I that's how I remember it. Uh, but this case is not about Medicare. This case is about Medicaid, C A I D. Uh, what is Medicaid? Medicaid is a government-run health insurance policy for uh, certain types of people with low incomes and certain people people with disabilities and other other types of conditions. Right. Um, Medicaid is run by the states, but funded by the federal government, right? So the Texas government basically operates on Medicaid program and the feds pay for it, right? This is what's called a spending program. Think of the highway funding in South Dakota v. Dole. Congress gives Texas a boatload of money and say, we want you to run this healthcare program for, 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 for poor people and here's how we want you to run it, right? Here are the conditions, right? Uh, as a result, Medicaid differs from state to state, right? Uh, before the ACA, some states covered people at this level of income, and other states covered people at this level of income, and they had different, different rules, different types of coverages. The ACA sought to expand Medicaid, expand Medicaid. That's what's called Medicaid expansion. Um, I'm going to use numbers that aren't exact, but it'll make it easier promise. The law said that if you are at 130th percent of the poverty line, that is you're above the poverty line, you are not eligible for Medicaid. Right? No matter what state you live in, all states now to need to give insurance to people at 130 percent of the poverty line. Right? Before, let's just say it was at the poverty line, now even more people are eligible. Get one with me. Um, now, what happened if a state declined to expand Medicaid? Uh, the federal government told the states that if you don't expand Medicaid, you will lose all of your Medicaid funding, all of it. And I think in some cases, we're talking the billions of dollars. Now, you might say, Josh, why would a state not want to expand Medicaid? Isn't all federal money? No, the states have to pay money of their own pocket, right? The states have to pay more to cover some of the new enrollees. One second. 
So there were some costs imposed in the state. It wasn't just like free money. Yeah. When you say billions of dollars, are you talking like in the aggregate or like one state could potentially lost? I think Arizona Arizona will have lost about eight billion dollars, if my memory is correct. It's a lot of money. We'll put the same That's what I'm trying to like. No, it, it would have bankrupted the state. They couldn't afford to. Yeah. And this will come back to later. But the states were basically told if you do not um, go along with the expansion, you can lose all of your funding. There was one letter sent to Arizona that played a role in the litigation. All right, so those are the two major constitutional challenges to the ACA. The first was about the mandate, and the second was about the Medicaid expansion. All right, any questions so far? No? All right. Um, now, if you were a law student um, during this time, right, and I gave you an exam question, and I said, could Congress make you buy health insurance? I can say with a high degree of certainty that every law professor in the country, except for maybe one or two, maybe three, would have said, of course Congress can make you buy health insurance. Now, why am I so certain about this? Because I don't think I actually understood this case until fairly late on. This is why Randy had a significant role. He had argued Rach, and he understood this case better than anyone else. But let's just walk through the cases that we have, right? Um, we have Wickard. Wickard was from, I think, 42. And Wickard held that Congress can regulate um, local activity if that local activity had a substantial effect on economic activity. Right? That was a holding in Wickard, right? which broadened the scope of Congress's Commerce Clause. See, Commerce Clause, right? Commerce Clause, there it is. Commerce Clause Authority. Uh, but then we have Rach a couple years later. In 2005, oh, not a couple, of, a couple of decades later, in 2005. Um, and Reach considered whether Congress could regulate um, the local cultivation of marijuana. Of course, this was Randy's case. Um, and the court held in Reach that Congress could regulate this local activity. Because the word economic, economic activity includes cultivation of commodities. Uh, but we also had Justice Scalia's opinion on the Necessary and Proper Clause. Right? Justice Scalia said when you have this sort of national scheme, which is about prohibiting drugs in the black market, Congress can regulate local activity to ensure this national scheme is effective. So where does that leave us? for the ACA. Congress can regulate local activity that's necessary to ensure the operation of a federal scheme. Okay, let's talk about Obamacare. We have this guaranteed issue in community rating policy. right? We have these policies that require insurance companies to issue policies to anyone. But in order to make that system work, we need the mandate. We need people to buy into the insurance marketplace so that we have a healthy insurance risk pool, right? Congress said we cannot have guaranteed issue without a mandate. They said it's essential. It was essential. So why can't Congress regulate this local activity in order to ensure the effective operation of its national scheme? Doesn't that flow directly from reach? And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I confess error every year. I, I bought that argument for some time because um, I didn't quite appreciate the precedence of the court. And this is really, uh, I give a lot of credit to Randy, um, but also uh, to uh, some of his co-authors, uh, Todd Gaziano and Nate Stewart, a few other people. Um, and they recognized something about rage that I never really noticed. Um, <laughs> Rach uses a word over and over again, um, and that word is activity. Um, we all know about economic activity, but use the word activity. And you might recall, remember the CIA in Lopez, the 
channels, instrumentalities, and, and activities. Uh, if you go back to Wickard, it talks all about activities, which suggests that Congress can regulate these sorts of classes of activities. But what about the ACA? This was Randy's primary contribution. Um, the ACA wasn't about regulating an activity, he argued. It was not about regulating an activity. Rather, it was a command to buy insurance. It was a command to buy insurance, which was, as Randy argued, and not, people disagree with him vigorously on this one, which was not activity, but inactivity. Right? The command to buy insurance was not activity, he argued, but was a class of inactivity. Now, I'll explain in a minute why people disagree with him. But once you accept this distinction, then you recognize that rage doesn't cover it. Right? That rage was about regulating local activity, and this isn't a local inactivity. Okay? Now, I'll give the, let me give you the other side. The other side argued that this was an insane argument. Right? That the decision to forego insurance, the decision to avoid insurance was activity. You were doing something, right? You were choosing to finance your health insurance by chance. You were not, you were not paying for health insurance now. You were rolling the dice that if you got injured, you'd have to pay a hospital out of pocket, right? So it wasn't uh, uh, inactivity. You were merely shifting the cost for your health care from now to later. And this is the position the government argued vigorously, um, uh, and which eventually did not get five votes at the court. Right? But the position was, how do we characterize the decision not to buy health insurance? Is this, a, is this activity? That is, you're choosing to finance your health insurance out of pocket, or finance your health care out of pocket? Or is it inactivity, which takes you beyond the realm of rage? And over the course of nearly two years, law professors argued and fought and bitterly waged war on this question of how to characterize the ACA. Everyone with me? Okay, any questions so far? All right. And the case ultimately boiled down <laughs> to a vegetable, if you will. And to this day, my friends, I cannot eat broccoli. It makes me think of John Roberts, and I just I, I can't do it. Uh, mostly joking. Uh, I never like broccoli, but I have an excuse. Uh, you know, George H. W. Bush never ate broccoli either. Uh, but this was in the cover of Reason magazine. Reason's a, it's a libertarian magazine. By the way, I I briefly considered putting broccoli in the front cover of my book. I'm grateful I didn't. That would have been a bad idea. Uh, but the argument was, can government make you buy broccoli? Now, what the hell does that mean, Josh? Now, it's not can they make you eat broccoli. That's people say, oh, can they make you eat broccoli? No, no, it's not about eating broccoli. Like, there might be some due process issues there, right? Uh, shoving stuff down your mouth. It's can they make you buy it? And what's the argument? Well, if people buy broccoli, they might eat it. And if they eat broccoli, they'll be healthier. And if they're healthier, their health care will be less expensive. Simple, right? Or another example, gym memberships, right? Can Congress make you buy a gym membership? If you buy a gym membership, you're healthier. And if you're healthier, then you won't need as much health care. Right? What can Congress make you buy in order to make their health care system work greater? Can they make you buy anything? Right? Had there been a history, right? Had there been a history of mandates to purchase commercial products? I also made the Simpsons, right? <laughs> can Congress make you buy a Chevrolet at the time General Motors was in possession of the US government, right? So this is the sort of debate that was popping up in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in popular culture. Uh, you don't need to be an expert in con law to know, can they make me buy something? Right? That's something people can understand. Right? I pay taxes, that's fine, but they can't make me buy something I don't want to do it. Right, any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 that was precisely the issue, right? Can they make you buy health insurance that you don't want? Yeah. So I'm kind of confused about <coughs> the government's uh, argument about uh, the cost shifting. I, I get that, but did they directly say that since eventually you're going to do it, that it is activity? 
Well, okay, so let me address this question, right? The government argued that eventually everyone will need health care, right? Everyone will get sick, right? Everyone will die. We're all mortal. Um, the other side responds that everyone will need health care, but not everyone will need health insurance. And this is a distinction that drove people nuts, and I, I don't want to slice it too thin. Uh, but everyone will need health care, right? We will die eventually. You know, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll be healthy and die in our sleep, I don't know. But everyone needs it, right? Um, but not everyone needs health insurance. If you're a person who doesn't want to buy insurance, you can decide to just risk it and just pay out of pocket and go into debt. Um, the other argument is uh, about, about broccoli, right? Um, everyone needs food to survive, right? But not everyone needs to eat broccoli. They can eat other things. So there are all these lengthy debates about whether you actually need it. I, I tend to think that you, know, you might need health care, but not health insurance. And I think the distinction matters. But you know, this is a nine-year-old case now. And the, the, uh, the, the wounds from this case have not healed, let's put it that way. People are still bitter about it. <laughs> I've gotten over it. I, first couple of years teaching, I hadn't gotten over it. I've gotten over it now, but I'm still a little bitter about it. You'll see why in a few minutes. I, it's like I keep hoping every time I was like, maybe it'll come out differently this time. But no, it, 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 it keeps coming out the same way. It's like, you know, you know, the book, maybe the page is changing, they rearrange and things. I actually, I actually wrote the book before the case was decided, right? I wrote the book in 2011 and 2012, and I actually had two different endings of the book, neither of which I could use. <laughs> Uh, I'd actually tell my publisher, okay, I'll get to this later, but I, I prepared two different endings. I was like, okay, we're, whichever one we'll, we'll use. And one, Kennedy for the fifth vote to uphold it, and the other one, Kennedy, fifth vote to strike it down. Neither was, neither was useful. It'll be the director's cut one day. Okay, questions? All right. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is, is this um, shifting of costs different from any of Ginsburg when she talks about your engaging in Yes, it's exactly what Ginsburg was talking about, right? When you, she said when you choose to forego insurance, you are taking a form of insurance called self-insurance because you're risking it. You're basically saying, I if I get sick, I'll pay for it out of pocket. And she said that was an activity. But that's exactly, Ginsburg makes that exact point. Good, good observation. All right. Yeah, yeah. Matt? Uh, Are you talking about the uh, the the commands and the hospitals and doctors? Right. So if someone if someone appears uh, in the hospital needing emergency care, for example, and they, they have no way to pay for it, the hospital is required to perform. Yes. So who who imposes that mandate? Is that state law? Or is that uh, th there's a law passed in the 1980s called EMTALA, uh, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Something Act. I remember what the L stands for, which, which and this is an old law, which says that. Uh, uh, hospitals that accept federal money, which is basically all of them, um, are required to um, uh, provide, I'm going to use the word stabilizing. It's not that meant the right word, but it's like to get the person stable, right, so that they can be discharged from the ER. They don't have to provide any sort of long-term care, but they got to stabilize the person. That, that, that's a mandate that predates Obamacare. And now, who, who pays the cost of that? The insurance companies and the hospitals shift it out, right? So when you go to the hospital and you pay $500 for an aspirin, Part of that is to cover the cost of compensated care. I'm, I'm grossly summarizing. That's the gist. Right, I'm just thinking that so if you're, a, if you're an insured person and you have, you have emergency, you need emergency care, you have, well, if you, you're, the argument Well, they'll send you a bill, which you, you may never pay. They won't collect right, it. Right. right. But, if, but those costs get covered anyway by being spread around the rest of the population. Right, which is one of the reasons why the ACA is considered important to decrease emergency room visits, although it's not clear that's happened. In fact, people now with insurance are more likely to go to the ER because it's, it's quicker and easier. It's, in some states with expanded Medicaid, people go to the ER, emergency room more often because it's free, and they won't get a bill. Right, and also that most of them uh, don't have a, uh, a primary care physician because they've never been in the health insurance market before. Uh, possibly, but, but it's, it's easier for it to be sure. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Uh, this is the president's signature. See, it's like very jagged. See like on the O? It's like very like, you know, because that's used different pens to write the O. Anyway, that's a fun fact. Okay, so the law, whatever, right? The law was signed on March 23rd, 2010. And within minutes, I'm talking like 20 minutes, the, um, the law was challenged in federal court across the country. 
the first major lawsuit was filed by Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli in Richmond. Now, you may know him. He is now the acting director of USCIS. There's, there's nothing new. It's just the same people keep, keep recycling, if you're sensing a pattern. Um, he was actually an alum of my law school, George Mason. I knew him way back when. Um, uh, but he was able to actually sue. And a federal district judge in Richmond, Judge Hudson, found that the ACA's mandate was unconstitutional. He argued that Congress cannot force you to buy health insurance. That was an unprecedented exercise of federal power. That was beyond what Congress could do. That Congress cannot make you buy a commercial product. If you're already buying something, they tell you what to buy, but they couldn't make you buy it. Right? Remember the phrase stream of commerce from civil procedure? If you're already in the stream of commerce, Congress can regulate you. But Congress can't shove you into that stream of commerce. All right. Uh, and the president could not have been very happy about this. Uh, and at the time, the ACA was not very popular. Uh, uh, the poll numbers were quite bad. Um, but the second lawsuit was one that actually really made a difference. The Florida Attorney General challenged the constitutionality of the ACA in federal court in uh, uh, Pensacola. Uh, this was a suit that was joined by eventually 26 uh, attorneys general, or 26 states, I should say. Um, now, why was a suit filed in Pensacola? Uh, something you'll learn well, it's called forum shopping. Uh, if you think forum shopping's gone, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, if you have a client and you're filing a case, I think you have a duty to that client to file in the best forum to help your client. I think it's malpractice not to. And they picked one where they thought the bench was strong for them, and they got uh, a Judge Vinson, who wrote a very strong opinion, a uh, very long opinion, too. And he found that the mandate to buy insurance was unconstitutional. He also held that if you strike down the mandate, that if the mandate's unconstitutional, the rest of the law has to fall apart. He described the ACA he compared to a Swiss watch. And like if you take one gear out of a Swiss watch, the entire thing will spring apart. Or it will not work. Um, the ACA, he said, was essential. It was a linchpin. It would held the entire law together. If you don't have the mandate, you can't have the guaranteed issue, and the entire thing falls apart. So at this point, the entire ACA was declared unconstitutional by a federal judge in Florida. Uh, the case was then appealed to uh, the U.S. I'm sorry, the U.S. Courts of Appeals. There was one in the 11th Circuit in Florida. There was one in the 6th Circuit in Ohio. Uh, there was one um, in the D.C. Circuit in District of Columbia. And there was one in the 4th Circuit in Virginia. By the way, you all know the Circuit Courts of Appeals, right? Right? First Circuit is, is, is a, a Northeast, then New York, Connecticut, and uh, a, a New Hampshire. Uh, Third Circuit is Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Fourth is West Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Uh, fifth, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. The 11th used to be part of the fifth. It's split in half in the 80s. So the 11th is Atlanta, Georgia, and Florida. The sixth, where I clerked, is Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Seventh is Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. The eighth is the most, like, sort of hodgepodge, right? But it goes all the way from North Dakota down to Arkansas. It's sort of this weird slice of the country. Uh, the ninth is the entire western part of the United States, as well as Alaska, Hawaii, and all the territories. Uh, and the 10th is sort of the, the, the square states, uh, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Mexico, and Kansas, and Oklahoma. And there's also the bitty, bitty DC circuit, which you cannot see there. Uh, and there's also the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. OK. Uh, the cases were primarily argued at the Court of Appeals by these two people, uh, Neil Katyal, who's now a regular on MSNBC, and Paul Clement, who's become one of the leading conservative uh, litigators of the Supreme Court. Uh, if you want to hear very good advocacy, listen to their arguments. They are fantastic. Both of them are. Uh, the first court to rule was the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals um, in Ohio, where I clerked. Uh, and the majority opinion was written by Judge Jeffrey Sutton, or the controlling opinion at least. And this court found that Obamacare was constitutional. So here the president was uh, thrilled, right? Obamacare was upheld. But then we had the appeal from Florida, from Pensacola, in the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And here a majority of the court, uh, Judge Frank Hull, Frank is a female, and Judge Dubina, uh, they declared that the Obamacare law was unconstitutional, that the mandate could not stand. Uh, now, they didn't strike down the entire law. They found that you could sever. That is, you can cut away the mandate, but you keep the rest of the law in place. But at this point, we had a circuit split. And as I'm sure you know, 
uh, when there's a split among the circuits, there's a very strong chance the Supreme Court takes the case, right? They have to. They can't have a rule where Obamacare is legal in half the states and not others. That would not work. Um, the next court to hear the case was the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I want to dwell on this one for a minute because I've not mentioned the taxing power. Taxing power. And this argument is a bit complicated, so just, just, just bear with me, I promise. I'll make it as clear as I can. Um, we did a case called United States versus DeWitt about a couple weeks ago. And DeWitt held that Congress cannot prohibit the sale of local oils. Remember that one? Okay. But what could Congress do? They could tax the sale of local oils. How is it that Congress can tax the sale of local oils, but they can't prohibit the sale? The courts held in the 1800s, long ago, that the taxing power is broad. That the taxing power lets Congress go after local activity. Right? So what if Congress had simply said to people, if you fail to buy insurance, you have to pay a tax. Right? That if you don't buy insurance, you have to pay a tax of $500 a year, whatever it is. Uh, would that law have been valid? Uh, probably. I think so. Um, now, why didn't Congress enact that law? Well, taxes are not popular. Right? Uh, the president ran on a promise of no new taxes. They all do. Maybe not anymore. But at least they did. Right? No new taxes. Uh, every member of Congress said that there's no new taxes. So when they were writing the ACA, they didn't use the word tax. They used the word penalty, right? They said, if you fail to buy insurance, if you fail to maintain minimum essential coverage, you are subject to a penalty. Okay, now what's the difference between a tax and a penalty? Well, in theory at least, if Congress imposes a tax, they can rely on the taxing power. Right, if Congress imposes a tax, they can rely on the taxing power. But if they're imposing a penalty, it's regulatory in nature. And a regulatory penalty has to rely on not the taxing clause, but the commerce and necessary and proper clauses. Right, so Congress has more discretion to regulate taxes than they do to regulate penalties. <coughs> Initially, the government argued in court, right, that this was a tax, right? That it was a tax. That the penalty was a tax, and therefore, the, the penalty was constitutional. But there's a problem with that argument that is somewhat obscure. Um, we're all adults here. Did we all file our tax returns last month or in April a couple months ago? I hope so. If you didn't, you're in trouble. Um, we have a system in this country where you pay your taxes and you ask questions later, right? That let's say you have a dispute, right? And the IRS assesses you a tax bill, and you say, no, 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 that bill's wrong. Can you go to court and challenge it and say, okay, I'll pay it when this court proceeding's over? No. Can you imagine that would be insane? People would be in court for years and never pay their taxes. The way it works is you challenge, I'm sorry, you pay your tax first, right? You pay your tax bill, and then you, court and you, sue, you go to court and you sue for a refund, right? You say this tax was, was incorrect, we have to pay first. Why can't you go to court to challenge a tax? Congress enacted something called the Tax Anti-Injunction Act. The Tax Anti-Injunction Act, or the AIA. Are you taking tax this term? No, you'll take it eventually. OK, well, yeah, eventually you'll take it. Right, the Tax Anti-Injunction Act says the courts will not hear a challenge to a tax until it's been paid. OK. If the Obamacare penalty is a tax, then you can't challenge it in court until it's been paid. When would the tax actually be paid? Not until 2014. So you have a problem. If the Obamacare penalty is actually a tax, then no one can challenge it until 2014. And guess what? That's after the election. And guess what? President Obama would not be in office anymore after 2014. So there was a fear. Right? That if we delay this litigation until after 2012, 
that the entire law will be killed in the middle of the next presidency. And the Obama administration decided they needed a more prompt resolution. But that creates a problem. If they argue that it's not a tax, then they take a constitutional clause off the table. Then they have to rely entirely on the commerce necessary and proper clauses. You see the riddle, right? If they rely on the taxing power, then they have the Anti-Injunction Act to worry about. But they take out the taxing power, let's resolve this now, they're stuck with commerce and necessary and proper clause. And they have the broccoli argument. So there was a lot of difficulty in this case that most people never quite appreciated. Uh, but at least one judge in the Fourth Circuit found that the ACA was, in fact, a tax. And he found that we could resolve it now. And that judge is not very important. I'm not going to talk about it much more. I will talk about the next judge, right? He was a judge in the DC Circuit. You know his name. He likes beer. His name is Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> Sorry. Again, the same cast of characters. Just no, it's, it's, Seriously, I've been getting these same damn slides for seven years, and it's like the same people keep just filtering through my life. Just, just, you know, it's, it's, just a re it's like my life is on repeat, and just it's the same thing over and over again. Deja vu. Um, in 2010, the case was argued for the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, the majority of the court, well, the court dismissed the challenge to the ACA. Um, but Judge Kavanaugh wrote a separate opinion. Um, it was technical. Uh, he, he's very smart. And he picked up on some obscure provision of the tax code. And I don't even understand his opinion. I don't think anyone does, right? He, it, it was really long. During the oral argument, the lawyer for the DOJ was arguing. And Kavanaugh was asking about this provision, and she just really had no idea. And the other judge goes, Mrs. Whatever, whatever her name was, do you know this provision? He's like, no, Your Honor, I have no idea. So he just he was picking on this obscure tax argument, which I, I, I'll have to go reread it one day. I just I, 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 I don't know what, what he was talking about. But at the end of his opinion, he had a couple sentences that were very useful for the government. He said, well, everyone agrees that if Congress enacted a tax on going uninsured, it'll be fine. Congress didn't enact that law. But the law they enacted is very similar, right? What they did was very similar to the hypothetical statute they made up. And he suggests that maybe the courts to save the law could read it as a tax. Um, Brett Kavanaugh planted the seeds for the John Roberts saving construction. And the government, this is uh, Solicitor General Don Verrilli, the top lawyer for the government, he recognized that Kavanaugh planted the seeds of how to save Obamacare. That even if it wasn't a tax, it's really similar to a tax. And it can be read as a tax. And that's the argument that was presented to the Supreme Court. Questions? Yeah. I don't think that's an act of bias at all. I disagree with the premise. I, I think Roberts and Kavanaugh would argue that courts have a duty to try to salvage laws. That's part of the judicial duty. I don't think that's bias at all. No, again, I, 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 I can criticize Roberts for a hundred reasons, but I don't think that's a, that particular thing is, is an act of bias. All right, let's take a quick five minute break. I'm lecturing way too much. Uh, and we'll come back at uh, 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 maybe uh, th uh, three after. Thanks. Thank you. 
All right, one more minute. We'll start in a minute. All right, let's get started. Back in your seats, please. All right. Um, all right. Where are we? Uh, we now have a circuit split. The sixth, the fourth, and the DC circuits upheld Obamacare, and the eleventh circuit declared it was unconstitutional. At this point, it became clear the Supreme Court would have to take the case. OK? Just a second. I don't think this isn't right. Uh, no, it's not right. OK. 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 Um, ah, there. Nope. I'm sure this camera's in or else it's going to fall out. Uh, no. Sorry. OK, I think I'm good. All right, uh, if it turns off, we'll know what happens. All right, at this point, the Supreme Court has to take the case. And this is why I don't like taking breaks. No one ever comes back in on time. It's not your fault, but it's why I never take breaks. Um, at this time, at this point, the court has to take the case. Um, at the time, we had the Roberts Court, which was a couple years old. We had the new Obama justices, Sotomayor and Kagan. And the court was sort of at a turning point, right? Um, you have these sort of older justices going back to the uh, Ford administration. Then you have the new justice with, with the Obama administration. Uh, here they're all at the Supreme Court looking all very happy uh, uh, and smiling. Um, but the court and the president had some run-ins. Um, during the 2010 State of the Union address, you may remember this, you probably don't, uh, there was a little bit of a run-in. The court had just decided the case of Citizens United versus FEC. Okay? Citizens United versus FEC. This is a case by campaign finance law. Uh, you'll probably cover it when you take First Amendment. Um, the upshot of this case was that the court declared unconstitutional certain limits on money and politics. And that's enough for me to say now. 
Uh, about a week after the case was decided, we have the State of the Union. And President Obama made a statement, and he said that the court overturned 100 years of precedent with Citizens United, and the court opened the floodgates of foreign funding. Now, those statements were not true. Um, I know they're not true. You know they're not true. But you know, politicians often make, uh, shall we say, exaggerated statements. right? Now they do it on Twitter. right? Politicians will sometimes just say things that aren't accurate, and it's, it's just, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, the only problem was Alito was there. And the camera was on him. And he was caught on camera saying, not true. Now, you're not supposed to do that, right? When you're a justice, you're supposed to sit there and be quiet and not say anything, because you're not supposed to be political. Yeah, Alito never had come back to the staging. That was his last trip. He just doesn't go back, which is probably for the good. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, a gift, by the way. That's not actually his hand. Uh, but but he, he was saying not true. But this just demonstrated that the president was not willing to criticize the court. Now, it's almost quaint right now. The sort of stuff we have to say about criticism of the court is like so much more intense. But back then, that was a big deal, right? At the time, that was a huge deal for Obama to say that. Now, now it's like, <laughs> that, 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 would be like that would be like the 6 a.m. tweets, like, oh, whatever, right? Uh, but, 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 but now, that was a big deal back then. I have to modulate, I think, because this, this talk evolves every year. Eventually, I'll write a third book on Obamacare if stuff's going on now. All right, so the case goes to the Supreme Court in March of 2010. Uh, has anyone ever been to the Supreme Court? Yes? Anyone, did you go to argument? No, I was like eight. Eight? Yeah? <laughs> I, was, I just went to Disney. Did anyone ever go for an argument? I actually see them in session. Well, I encourage you to. If you ever get a chance to go to DC on a day the court's in session, you should go. Uh, but it's not easy. Uh, as you know, there are no cameras inside the court, right? There are no cameras inside the court. So the only way to see it is to be there in person. Uh, the court does not sell tickets. You have to wait in line. It's like getting tickets for a concert, right? You have to camp out overnight. Um, they give out 50 tickets in the morning, around 6 or 7 a.m. So generally, if you're there you know, 10 p.m. the night before and you camp out, you might get a seat. You're laughing. Uh, I did that several times. It sucks. Um, Texas is nice and hot. DC in March is cold. Uh, the week of the Obamacare case, though, it was rainy and it was sleeting. It was very bad weather. Now, if you wanted a ticket for the Obamacare case, people got there four or five days in advance. And they camped on the sidewalk for four or five days. Now, if you notice, there are no tents. You can't use a tent. You can use a tarp. So basically, you're draped in blankets and a tarp for five days to get inside this argument. I did not go for this one. I went for other couple high profile cases. But this one, I was working at the time. I couldn't do it. Maybe I should have. I don't know. But I did it. Um, but eventually, argument day came. It was a bit of a circus, because you always have the protesters in the mall, and they're always making a scene. Uh, it's very, very dramatic. OK. The case will be argued over the course of three days. Most Supreme Court arguments take just one day. And in fact, they get one hour. But the Obamacare case was so significant, they scheduled nearly six hours of argument time over the course of three days. Six hours. That hadn't been done in decades. Um, here, was the, here was the blueprint. Right? Here, was the, here was the game plan. On the first day, day number one, was a Monday. Oops. On Monday, the court would hear arguments on the taxing issue. That is the Tax Anti-Injunction Act. Right? Could the court even hear the case now because the tax would not be assessed until 2014? That was day number one. That was Monday. Day number two, Tuesday, was about the constitutionality of the mandate with respect to the necessary and proper clauses and the commerce clause. Right? Was the mandate constitutional? Now, the government also argued that the taxing power supported it. Okay. Day number three, Wednesday, was a doubleheader. In the morning, they heard arguments on whether the um, uh, 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 on severability, right? That is, if the mandate was unconstitutional, 
What happens to the rest of the law? Right? Can you, does the rest of the law survive? And they also had arguments on the Medicaid expansion, right? Was the Medicaid expansion valid? All right, everyone get the, get the sequencing? Day one was the Tax Anti Injunction Act. All right, so let's start with the first day, with Monday. Uh, day one was viewed by most people as the most boring day, as the least important day, uh, but it proved to be the most significant day because this is where the government won the case. Now, let me walk you through the government's argument because it's not clear. All right, again, if the penalty was a tax, then the Anti Injunction Act denied the court's jurisdiction to hear the case until 2014. Obama wanted the case resolved now. He didn't want to wait until 2014 when he might be out of office. So what did the government argue on day number one? On day number one, the government argued that the ACA was not a tax, that the penalty was not a tax. Wait, what? On day number one, the government argued that the penalty was not a tax. Therefore, the court could hear the case now. But on day number two, the government argued that the penalty was a tax. Huh? One more time. I know this. I, I see the, the eyes rolling around in their, in their sockets, right? On day number one, the government argued that the penalty was not a tax. Therefore, the court had jurisdiction to hear the case now. But on day number two, the government argued that the taxing power could be used to support the constitutionality of the mandate. Wait a minute, Josh. How, how is this? How, how, how can you go to court on, on Monday and say it's not a tax, and then go to court on Tuesday and say it is a tax, right? I mean, estoppel, right? I mean, I don't know what word you want to use. Like, how, how can you make an entirely inconsistent argument back to back days? How can you do that for the government? They were creative. They argue that when you're interpreting a statute, like the, in the Injunction Act, Congress, right? Congress might be stuck, right? When, they, when, when Congress is interpreting a statute, they have more flexibility. When Congress is interpreting a statute, they can decide what is and is not a tax. They can be flexible. They don't have to use labels. But when the court is interpreting the Constitution, it has to be deferential. When the court's interpreting the Constitution, they need to pick an argument that is plausible, that can result in upholding the law. They have to pick that argument. So the government could argue that for purposes of the Injunction Act, OK, you got us. It's not a tax. You got us. It's not a tax. But for the purpose of the Constitution, to uphold it, you need to read it as a tax to uphold the ACA. Everyone see that, right? Monday, not a tax. Tuesday, tax. This was the key of the entire case, right? Almost everyone missed it. I missed it at the time. I don't think I understood it until much later, right? Monday, not a tax. So you can hear the case now. Tuesday for the Constitution, it is a tax. And that was the groundwork. But the government had another task. They had to show it wasn't actually a penalty, that it was a tax, right? Remember, the statute labels it a penalty. They said, well, look. The label doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you call it. The, the, they call it an exaction, which I don't like that word, but exaction means when the government takes money. The exaction looks like a tax. You pay it to the government with your taxes to the IRS. It's small, right? As long as you pay the tax, there are no consequences, right? You're not breaking the law. You're not a lawbreaker. This is not a penalty. Right, you're not going to jail if you don't buy insurance. You just have to pay the tax. And so the government said, this resembles a tax in every way. So for the purposes of the Constitution, you should read it as a tax. Everyone understand? This was the government's fallback argument. I'm going to go through Commerce Clause in a few minutes, right? But the government's fallback argument was you should read it. You should read the penalty as a tax in order to pull the mandate. Again, 
it wasn't that Obamacare actually imposed a tax, but that the court should read the penalty as a tax to save the law's constitutionality. Any questions so far? All right, so that was day one, right? That was day one. Day two would be between uh, Solicitor General Don Verrilli and Paul Clement. Um, now, this was the big day. This was like, is the mandate constitutional? Um, and the Solicitor General had a very rough start. Um, he did something you should never do. A few moments before his oral argument, he took a sip of water. He began his remarks, and then he went silent. The water went down the wrong pipe. He was up there before the US Supreme Court choking. He could not <laughs> breathe. So the biggest case of his life, he was gagging in front of the Supreme Court. Um, the, the Republican National Committee actually made a commercial about it. They actually doctored it. They, 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 they basically made the, the silence sound twice as long as it did. But it was at eight seconds of silence. And they said, even the Obama lawyers can't defend Obamacare. You know, they, this is, it, was, it was a bad, bad commercial. I'm not a fan of it. Because they, they doctored the order and they sounded worse. But let me tell you something, right? You want to hear professional. He got up there, he said a few words, he started choking. He regained his composure. He began his argument again from the beginning, <coughs> verbatim. He has, he has openly committed to memory, perfect. Word for word. You think you can do that? You go to the Supreme Court, start choking, then you repeat your exact opening line verbatim. This is, this is why they're, they're where they are. Uh, so I, I respect Don Verrilli. He, he, he pulled it back. But it went downhill from there. Uh, that, you know, I can tell him a good story, but he had a hard time. And why did he have a hard time? Um, it was the inability to articulate a limiting principle, which is a, the issue that keeps popping up in all of our cases, right? Uh, I think I showed you in Lopez the argument with Justice Ginsburg. And Justice Ginsburg was asking the Solicitor General, what are the limits, right? What are the limits? And he wouldn't identify one. Um, in other words, if Congress can make you buy a commercial product and then regulate what product you buy, what can Congress make you do, right? That the entire range of human activity can now come from the scope of the federal government. And these were questions that the Justice asked, right? What's your limit? And really said, well, maybe healthcare special, right? Only everyone needs healthcare. The responsible, everyone needs food, right? Can they make you buy broccoli? Justice Scalia asked about that. Um, uh, you know, they said, well, you, this is a, this is not actually a form of um, regulating inactivity. This is a form of cost shifting. Uh, that Justice Ginsburg wrote about. We're simply shifting when you pay for it. Uh, but if that's the case, anything you buy can be by cost shifting. The government had trouble articulating a limiting principle um, because there really isn't one, right? Beginning with the New Deal, the courts basically said the entire range of human conduct can be within the scope of the federal power. And what the Rehnquist and the Roberts Court did was said, OK, we're not going to reverse the New Deal cases. We're simply not going beyond them. Right? We're going to leave those decisions in place, but we're going to create these sort of artificial barriers to like, you know, contain them. So the Lopez barrier was economic activity, that the activity had to be economic in nature. Did Wickard have that requirement? Of course not. But the Rehnquist Court tried to cabin those. And what was the, the limit from NFIB? The limit from NFIB was about activity versus inactivity. That Congress kind of imposed a purchase mandate. Now, the exact mechanics of this were actually a little bit uncertain till the end. Why could Congress not impose a purchase mandate? The answer turns to the necessary and proper clause, right? The court held. Right, the court held, and this is by saying court, I'm talking about Chief Justice Roberts here. Chief Justice Roberts held that the mandate might be necessary. Right? In order to have guaranteed issue, it's absolutely necessary to have this mandate. Right? You want people to be in the system. Right? It's convenient to use Chief Justice Marshall's word. Even though it was necessary, however, the mandate was not proper, right? Why was it not proper? The court doesn't give a terribly good explanation, uh, but they suggest that this was a great independent power 
that was too big to fit within Nestor and proper, right? That this was such a great power to make people buy insurance, you can't squeeze it into the Nestor and proper clause. That's have a standalone authority, right? You can't intrude. You can't force people to buy insurance product. This has never been done before. And, and NFIB makes clear what was implicit in some of the other cases we studied, that necessary and proper are separate analyses. And here the court found that it was not proper. Okay, So the court found that first, the Commerce Clause by itself can't cover this because it's not commerce among the states. Second, this might be a necessary aspect of federal power, but it's not a proper aspect of federal power. And third, let's talk about the taxing power. Okay. What does John Roberts actually hold? The Chief Justice holds, in his opinion, this is a key part, that Congress did not enact a tax, right? That the penalty used to enforce the ACA is not a tax. But, and here comes the big but, we can follow the lead of Justice Kavanaugh, or, or Judge Kavanaugh, Right? Let's pretend that Congress didn't actually enact a mandate. Let's pretend that Congress merely put a tax on the uninsured. That law would unquestionably be unconstitutional. So Chief Justice Roberts said, in order to uphold the constitutionality of the ACA, we're going to adopt the Kavanaugh construction. We're going to pretend, I use the word pretend, it's not the real word, but we will pretend that there's no mandate to buy insurance, there's merely a tax on those who go uninsured. And he says, we can make this assumption because it resembles the law we have here in many regards, right? The penalty is low, you have a low tax. You don't go to jail for being uninsured, there's no consequences, right? The, the, the penalty raises revenue, it resembles a tax. So ultimately what the court holds Upholds, I'm sorry, but the court upholds is not the AC that was written. They upholds a different version. The court upholds a version of the law in which there's no mandate. Yes, you heard me right. We've been litigating for two years with the constitutionality of the mandate, and the court holds there is no mandate because the law can be read as a tax. Let me say that again. The court actually holds that there was no mandate because the law can be read as a tax, therefore, there's no command to buy insurance, and we don't need to strike down the law, right? There's no command to buy insurance. That was a, I mean, that's a significant holding, right? We've been litigating for two years about the mandate. And the upshot of the case the chief holds is we don't have to decide this question, right? Because we can hold as a tax. We can save the law. He held that the mandate was unconstitutional, but because the law can be read otherwise, we don't need to strike it down. Right? That was the crux of the holding. And that came from the Solicitor General's argument and also Justice, uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Everyone with me, right? Most people do not understand this, right? I, and I, I don't mean this in a mean sense. Most people just don't get this. They, they'll simply say that Chief Justice Roberts upheld the ACA's attacks. That is not right. That's not right. It's not right. And it matters for stuff that's going on now. What the court held is that there was a mandate to buy insurance and it was unconstitutional, but because the AC as a whole could be understood to impose a modest tax, then the law can be upheld. But what happens, my friends, if the AC cannot be understood to impose a tax? What happens if Congress reduces the penalty to zero dollars and the uh, mandate doesn't collect any revenue anymore? Does the saving construction so hold? This issue is being litigated as we speak. This is a decision pending from the Fifth Circuit. In 2017, Congress, in fact, dropped the penalty down to zero. So it no longer collects revenue. And the second they did this, like, wow, Obamacare is unconstitutional now. I was like, I knew this, right? It can't occur to me. Uh, Texas, your Attorney General, and others have challenged the ACA. And they argued that now the mandate's unconstitutional and cannot be saved. I think there's a decent chance that the um, court will agree. Uh, for what it's worth, the lower court cited my book a couple times, which is always nice. Um, I'm sure you won't appreciate that when you read the opinion, but uh, uh, it's always good to be cited. Uh, but we'll see what happens. I think this case will probably go Texas this way, at least in the lower courts. Uh, not confident about the votes of the Chief Justice or Kavanaugh at all.
Well, actually, I'm very confident about their votes, but not that they'll rule uh, with Texas. I think they'll probably go the other way. All right. Questions on the necessary and proper clause, the commerce clause, or the taxing power? OK. Uh, let's move on to the Medicaid expansion, because I haven't really talked about this uh, much. Um, we discussed last class, I think it was last class, South Dakota v. Dole. Okay. Um, in South Dakota v. Dole, uh, consider the spending power. And the court basically says that um, Congress can give money to the states um, with strings attached. And then if a state doesn't want to comply with a string, they can just lose the money. Um, and you recall that Chief Justice Rehnquist identified four factors, then those were a fifth factor. The fifth factor that Chief Justice Rehnquist identified asked whether the spending condition might be considered coercive. Um, coercive, that is, if the state was at risk of losing too much money, then the state did not have a meaningful choice about whether to decline. Um, until 2012, the court never found a spending condition that was coercive. Um, the lower courts in the Obamacare litigation did not find a coercive spending, right? There was no judge that found anything coercive until John Roberts. Now, um, we know some stuff about this case that's not so, that doesn't put John Roberts in the best light. Um, uh, the vote in this case was complicated. There were five votes who found that the mandate was unconstitutional. Right? Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Right? F writing this down. There were five votes who found that the mandate was unconstitutional. Right? There was Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Um, there were also five votes who found that the mandate could be read as a tax. Roberts, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Right, Roberts, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. So there were five votes to uphold the ACA. But then we get to the Medicaid expansion, and it's funky. Ginsburg and Sotomayor would have upheld the expansion in its entirety. Um, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito, the four, they would have killed the expansion in its entirety. Then what about the other three? Roberts, Breyer, and Kagan reached a middle solution. Right? They found that the mandate, I'm sorry, the expansion was coercive. That the states did not have a meaningful choice to decline the spending, that it would taken billions of dollars away. But rather than kill the expansion, they took a middle of the road solution. They said, well, states can opt in. That states should have a choice about whether they go into the Medicaid expansion. Um, the Chief Justice effectively rewrote both the penalty provision, he declared it to be read as a tax, and he rewrote the Medicaid expansion provision. He said it was optional. Neither of those were Congress had designed. But why did Kagan and Breyer join? Um, we had long speculated about this, but now we have some backup in a fairly reputable book that apparently Breyer, Roberts, and Kagan were negotiating. They said, OK, uh, if you two come along and you join me in the Medicaid expansion, I'll uphold the uh, laws of tax, or something like that. You know, the same way you go to a flea market and you're bargaining. If you give me three of those, I'll give you two of these. Uh, that's how our judges work. And I think uh, and anything of John Roberts' efforts to try and make judges look apolitical, this was the exact opposite. So, so as you were saying about bias, I don't, I don't use the word bias. I think that's, that's a bad word. Uh, but I think the, the chief's understanding of the role of a judge is very warped, uh, very, very <laughs> warped, that you horse trade, right? You trade. You know, give me two of these, I'll give you one of those. Right? Give me an apple, I'll give you an orange. Right, you, you let us kill the Medicaid expansion in part, and I'll save the rest of the law. Now, Sotomayor and Ginsburg are fairly, I don't use what ideological, that's the wrong word, fairly principled. 
they wouldn't go along with that nonsense. But Kagan and Breyer want to give the appearance of unanimity and bipartisanship went along with it. Um, it doesn't reflect well on any of them, but Obamacare survives. Uh, but there was a consequence of sort of half measure, right? Um, the ACA was not designed for states to opt out of the Medicaid expansion. Let me explain why. Uh, if any of you go on the Obamacare marketplace, you get something called a subsidy, right? Which where the government pays part of your insurance premium. What if you're in that band, though, between 100% of the poverty line and 130% of the poverty line, right? These are people who should be eligible for Medicaid. But Texas, for example, hasn't opted in. As a result, what about those people in that middle band? They're screwed. Why? They're not eligible for subsidies. The law didn't consider them to even get subsidies because they were on Medicaid. Why would they need health insurance from the, the marketplace? So there's an entire band of people in the United States who cannot get any health care. That this rewriting of the law screwed a lot of people over very badly. This was John Roberts' rewrite. So there was a story years ago about Texarkana, which is a city, you know, it's around the Texas-Arkansas border. If you're on the Arkansas side, you're fine. If you cross the street in Texas side, you, you lose your insurance and you can't afford it. Um, so the law we have now, again, is like a mutant, right? It wasn't the original version that was drafted. It's been uh, chopped up and sliced up in so many different ways. Um, so the, 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 the effort of rewriting the statute, as the court did, I think is uh, quite problematic. But in the end, right, in the end, you now had five votes to pull the law in its entirety, and you had seven votes to kill most of the Medicaid expansion, but it survives mostly. Uh, and to this date, about 30-something states have opted in, and the other ones have not. Texas has not opted into the Medicaid expansion. Um, OK, that's the holding the case. I want to talk about the fun stuff that comes afterwards later. Oh, I got some fun pictures. Um, yeah, Scalia was just as broccoli, not the cover of my book. And they asked about General Motors. OK. Uh, OK. All right, so any other questions on the actual holding of the case? Now, at the time, right, uh, when, when the case was decided, uh, most people, me, assume that Justice Kennedy would be the tie-breaking vote. Uh, in fact, I, I told you I wrote two different versions of my book for the ending, one in which Roberts, I'm sorry, uh, Kennedy upholds the law, and the other one where Kennedy votes to strike it down. And I told my agent, I'm like, look, hey, here are just two different proposals. Uh, you send out whichever one you think is going to happen. You know, whichever one happens, just send it out. Okay, why was I doing that? Um, I had scheduled a conference in London uh, for the day after the Supreme Court's term concluded. Right? I knew roughly when it would happen, I wasn't sure, but I said, okay, I'll fly to London the day the term finishes. I'll read the opinion on the plane. It'll be great, right? Um, it was not going to happen that way. Uh, because the Chief Justice uh, decided to change his mind. And there are lots of reports about exactly what happened. Uh, but the upshot is, at some point, Chief Justice Roberts was on the fence. He said, well, I think the mandate can't be supported by the commerce and necessary and proper clauses. But maybe we can do something with the taxing power. And he sort of struck this, this bargain with Kagan and Breyer, where they kill part of the expansion, but they leave the Medicaid, I'm sorry, they leave the mandate in place as a tax. And that's the law was saved. Um, you know, I'm not, not a fan of this mode of judicial decision making, but that's what we're stuck with for the next 30 years. Lord help us, right? Um, so in other words, I like, no, this is not a tax, this is not a penalty, this only protects the government intrusion. Okay. But uh, this one I like to, uh, I murdered 12 people, I didn't buy health insurance. Uh, but it's actually not true because it was not a crime. Robert said, there's no crime if you go uninsured. Okay, and this is my favorite Thomas picture. This is his dissent where just <laughs> everything's unconstitutional, just the entire thing. And then uh, Brian and Kagan did put their sort of compromise, and Ginsburg and Sotomayor were down for the count. They were not going to go along with the nonsense of, of this middle of the road approach. Now, here comes the fun part, right? So I said, OK, I think my flight was scheduled to take off around 10.30 AM uh, Eastern time. The Supreme Court starts its session at 10 AM, and they announce their opinions. And as the opinions are announced, they are put, uh, a link to the PDF is put online. Right? That's usually how it works. Uh, this was in 2012. Now, every year when the Supreme Court's finishing its term, there's a tradition. It's called the running of the interns. You know about this? Where every single news station, NBC, ABC, CBS, they put an intern at the Supreme Court with sneakers. 
and they wave them to hand these, you know, these thick opinions. And the second they get the opinion, they run all the way out down the front steps to the cameras which are waiting on the streets. And this is how it works. They shove in the reporter's face this 150-page opinion. And the reporter's expected to go on air immediately to say what just happened. Now, did they actually read the opinion? No. On the first page of any Supreme Court decision is something called a syllabus, right? A syllabus is like a summary. So what happens if you know, you're a June 2012 intern running as fast as she can, hands the opinion to the CNN lead, report, re lead reporter on the street, and he reads the first page of the syllabus. And he gets to the bottom where it says, the Chief Justice found that the mandate cannot be supported by the Commerce and Necessary Proper Clause. What do you think happened? This was fake news before fake news was a thing, right? It wasn't just CNN, by the way. The reporter, a nice guy named Bill Mears, I know, I know him very well, he reads the first page where it says, Roberts found the mandate unconstitutional. And then he reports that live on CNN. And it goes global. For about 15 minutes, the entire world thought that the mandate was struck down. Guess who's watching CNN? Obama, right? <laughs> so the president was sitting there in his office in the White House. This is not an actual picture of him at the time, but this is probably what his, his face looked like, where he thought Obamacare was done. Now, why couldn't anyone get the opinion? The website was down. So many people are trying to flood the website that no one can get to the PDF. Now, Fox the same, Megyn Kelly, a long time ago, uh, Megyn Kelly was the same, Obamacare is unconstitutional. Now, what about poor Josh, right? Well, I was sitting on the tarmac at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, about to take off for London. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, you know, my girlfriend was supposed to send me the opinion, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and she sends me a message, like, I can't get to the website, it, it's, it's done. Right? I'm like, oh, come on, keep loading. I'm on my phone. Right? And she says, she said, actually, like, the court struck an Obamacare. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I'm like, that, that, that's amazing. Right? And then I'm like, send me the opinion. She's like, I can't get it. Okay. As we're about to take off, I get my last message before the sky hits. <laughs> and the message says, I still have, it's my G-chat. <laughs> Roberts wrote to save the mandate as a tax. <laughs> then at eight hours of silence. <laughs> there was no Wi-Fi back then. There was no power on the planes. My laptop died in a couple of hours, right? I was in utter silence for eight or nine hours crossing the Atlantic. No Wi-Fi, nothing. So this entire like storm was brewing beneath me, and I just had no idea what was going on. Um, and in hindsight, it's actually probably for the best that I wasn't like involved with that insanity. I, I took a nap, you know, I sort of relaxed a bit, and, and I was trying to figure out what the hell happened? How did Roberts uphold that? Okay. And the second I landed in London, I landed on a midnight local time. It was a, you know, a daytime flight. I cleared customs, I got to a computer. I stayed up all night, read the entire opinion, and I'm like, what, what on earth just happened? And it didn't, it didn't hit me for some time until later. That's like we have a presentation in London. But this was a dramatic moment. And eventually, someone walked into Obama's office and said, no, no, you won. He's like, wait a minute, I thought I lost. No, no, you won the case. So we have you know, a, a Dewey defeats Truman moment for the iPad era. <laughs> um, but in the end, he prevailed, right? The Medicaid expansion was killed in part. Chief Justice Roberts did a little bit of surgery. Uh, and this was one of the first moments people started having doubts about the Chief Justice. Uh, Glenn Beck and others attacked him. But don't forget, we had an election coming up. Mitt Romney, yes, the same Mitt Romney who invented Romney care in Massachusetts was running for president. Uh, he was possibly the worst candidate on the most significant issue of the year. Uh, during one of the debates, Obama called Romney the godfather of Obamacare. Uh, and I think it was, I think it was an accurate description. Okay. Fast forward till 2012, President Obama wins his reelection. And I thought, what do I know, right? I thought that would be the end of the fight over Obamacare. Like, okay, I guess everything's over now. Things are gonna go back to normal. Not even close. Um, the next four years would be nonstop litigation over Obamacare. And now here we are almost what, seven years later, almost a decade after the law was enacted. We're still in court fighting over Obamacare. Um, these issues are not going away anytime soon. Uh, every year I teach this case, there are more wrinkles. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny. 
he's gone, he's not. Uh, that's the thing about justices, they, they stick around forever. Presidents come and go, but the justices stay the same. And Anthony Kennedy is not the most important American, it's, it's that person um, until we get the next nominee, and in case he'll be less important. All right, I'm gonna stop there, and let's ask some questions. I cover a lot of material. No one wants to ask questions now, they wanna go home. Please, yeah. Yes. Uh, so the question was, had they changed a the penalty to zero? Uh, here's a fun fact. So remember I told you that the law uh, was enacted in a very funky way because there was a filibuster-proof majority and they lost it? Um, when Speaker Pelosi passed the law in the House, she used something called the budget reconciliation process. The budget reconciliation process. That process allows you to make certain changes to financial aspects of a law with less than 60 votes. So the actual penalty, the dollar amount was set, not by the 60 vote majority, but by the less than filibuster proof majority. So in 2017, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was enacted through the tax reconciliation process, the budget reconciliation process. And this allowed Congress to drop the penalty from about $600 to $0. So the penalty wasn't actually repealed, to be precise. It was reduced to $0. And everyone can pay a $0 penalty because there's $0 collected. So that's where the law is today. Answer your question? Yes, but then does it take a while for it to like, actually take effect? Yes, so the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was passed in 2017, and it goes into effect for the 2019 tax year, so now. So when you pay your 2020, I'm sorry, when you pay your 2019 taxes in 2020, right, in April of 2020, when you file your next return, you will not have to pay a penalty for going uninsured. Well, you're pay well, you're, 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 you, you paid it for your 2018 taxes, which you, you, you filed in 2019. See, taxes are delayed by a year, right? The money you earn in 2017, you pay taxes on it in 2018. The money you earn in 2018, you pay taxes on it in 2019. So in 2019, right now, you're not being assessed it. And when you file your taxes in 2020, you're not gonna have to pay it. Okay. Not giving tax advice, but I think I just did. Yeah. expansion population and then rationing it down to only 90% uh, in the out years while the states were currently paying about half that money. Right, uh, so there were, there were good carrots, but there would be cost in the long term because once you enter, you can't exit. So when you, when you assess the cost, you can't just look at years one through five, you have to look at years indefinite, mm -hmm. right? Um, I didn't go too far into depth, but there was actually a, a discussion whether it was actually a new condition or whether Congress always had these conditions in effect. Uh, far beyond the scope of your class, but the court at least found this condition was too coercive. Even Breyer and Kagan went along with it, but we know they did so for other right. reasons. Horse trading. Horse trading, yeah. <coughs> other questions? All right, let me, let me summarize a bit, um, and, and this will help, I think, bring things together. Um, uh, so where are we now, right? Uh, where are we with the Commerce Clause and Nesting Proper Clause? Um, the New Deal cases are still good law. Um, NFIB did not, and please don't say NFIB, please don't, it's NFIB. Randy hates me, people say NFIB, it's not a word. It's an actual group called NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Business. Um, NFIB did not reverse the New Deal precedents. Those are still in place. Instead, what NFIB did and what Lopez did was try and put barriers around those cases. They said, okay, we've gone this far, but we're not going further. And they erected limits that are frankly artificial, that aren't based in text or history, right? Right? They said, well, uh, you can only regulate ec activities that are economic, and then you can't regulate inactivity, right? This is basically just parsing the words in Wickard very carefully. It's parsing the words in Rage carefully. Justice Thomas said, this is insane. Congress can regulate commerce, not activities. So perhaps the Thomas approach would be just say, get rid of all this stuff and just go back to regulating commerce. The majority doesn't go quite that far. They don't. They will only go so far as to say, we're going to uh, abide by these precedents, perhaps in name only, but we're not going to go any further beyond them, right? We're going to limit it to activity that's economic in nature, not non-economic, not non-economic activity, and not inactivity. 
Um, as for the taxing power, um, I don't know how much relevance this precedent has. It's sort of a very disjointed. Uh, but Chief Justice Roberts left the Obamacare law in a very tough position, right? If you think about it, the Obamacare case left Obamacare hanging by a thread, just sort of dangling. And then when the court, I'm sorry, when Congress enacted the Tax Cut Act, they sliced that thread. And they sort of left it hanging even more precariously. Uh, so the, the court's decision may have saved Obamacare one day, but it made it in a very rocky position for the future. Um, the second part of the opinion is about the spending clause, right? This is the only case in which the court found that the spending condition was too stringent, too coercive. Um, I don't know what else would fit. The court didn't give a bright line rule. It said, if it's more than X percent of your budget, it's coercive, right? We don't have a rule like that. It simply said, well, this is too much. And what's too much, well, we don't know. That's resolved on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so I worry that you know well, we may never see a case again that has a sort of salient. But, but the NFIB case really brought together so many doctrines uh, and such an important case to uh, teach and study. And uh, I like teaching them. OK. Questions? No? I will see you all on Thursday. Have a wonderful day.